now. Selfridges is launching our biggest beauty event ever. What are you doing? It's my window. In business, Selfridge, never let your heart rule your head. Selfridges wasn't the same without you. It's no wonder you can't get jobs. You're disgrace. Shut it! I don't know him anymore. He frightens me. The all-new series of Mr. Selfridge continues Sunday at 9 on ITV. Now the latest ITV news in the Tyne Tees region with Pam Royal and Ian Payne. Good evening, welcome to ITV News for Tyne Tees. These are tonight's headlines. Terrified, the moment this shop worker is forced to hand over money at gunpoint. I couldn't get the till open, so my hands were shaking when I was doing that, and then I just gave him the money and he left. Keep on burning, the underground fire that refuses to go out. We hear from former Foreign Secretary William Hague on his plans for life post-politics. And as the stars come out for the BAFTAs this weekend, we unmask the brains behind the glittering ceremony. Hello, good evening. First tonight, a shop worker has told us of the terrifying moment a robber burst into her shop and pointed what appeared to be a gun at her, demanding money. It happened this morning when Jeanette Greenwell was on shift at the store in Wall's End on North Tyneside. She told our correspondent, Kenny Toll, that at first she thought it was a sick joke. But very quickly, she realised the robber was deadly serious. This is the terrifying moment Jeanette Greenwell found herself staring down the barrel of a gun. It happened just before seven o'clock this morning. A man burst into this newsagent's in Wall's End demanding money. He cocks what appears to be a handgun and stands with his bag open as Jeanette struggles in her panic to open the till. He fills the bag with all the notes she has before running out of the shop past startled customers, saying sorry as he fled. I looked up and there was a man standing in front of the counter and I noticed the bright yellow hoodie first and then that's when I looked up again and obviously that's when he had said give us your money and then when I when I looked properly that's when he had the gun in his hand. Police say they've increased patrols in the area following the robbery to reassure people living here. What do you think when you see it now? See it back? I still think it's a joke. It just doesn't seem real. Watching the footage for the first time Jeanette says it's difficult to comprehend that she's the one with the gun pointed at her. In all, it lasted just 20 seconds, but it felt so much longer. I honestly thought he was joking at first, um, and then obviously I realised he wasn't, and obviously I couldn't get the till open. So my hands were shaking when I was doing that, and then I just gave him the money and he left. Diane Patterson has run this shop for the past 30 years, and she's never seen anything like this. We're known locally around the area, and... Um, that's why I, I don't know if there's someone local or not, because everybody knows where, so... And everybody's shocked, even the local community's shocked. It's an awful thing for Jeanette ha to have to go through, and she handled it really, really well. Proud of her. This is a community that looks after its own, a community that sticks together. And the hope is that somewhere in this community, someone will know who did this. Kenny Toll, ITV News, Newcastle. Police say they are stepping up patrols in the Gateshead area after two teenage girls leaving an army reservist centre claimed they were subjected to violent threats. Two men in a Vauxhall Zafira are alleged to have asked the pair if they were in the army before shouting at them as they drove past the cadets. Well, our correspondent Tim Batchel is outside the barracks for us now. Tim, how seriously are the police taking this? The police have to take any threat of this nature seriously. Uh, the two teenage girls were leaving this Army Reserve Centre in Alexandra Road in Gateshead when two men shouted over at them from their car, asking if they were in the Army. They also then made a reference to beheading. Now, clearly, this may just be threatening words, but 
ever since the murder of Fusilier Lee Rigby in London and the recent attacks in Paris. The police have to be very vigilant indeed. They've issued a statement tonight. In it, they say inquiries are ongoing to establish the exact nature of what was said during the incident. As a precaution, we have notified staff at other Army Reserve centres in the area and have had extra officers on patrol in Alexandra Road to reassure residents. Now, the police say they have traced the vehicle involved and have issued a photo of it, but they're still trying to identify the driver. They describe this as an isolated incident, and that view has been backed up tonight by a professor of peace studies at Bradford University. He says while these sort of incidents are unfortunate, it would be wrong to overreact. Tim in Gateshead, thank you very much. The Fire Brigades Union has described the decision to close stations in Sunderland and Newcastle as a genuine threat to public safety as they prepare to protest tomorrow. Tynan Weir Fire and Rescue must lose 20% of its staff and close Sunderland Central Fire Station as part of a plan to deal with budget cuts handed down by the government. Well, our correspondent Dan Ashby spent the day with firefighters whose station may soon no longer exist. Firefighters are used to seeing buildings at risk, less familiar, knowing they may soon lose their own base as well. This is one of three stations that's likely to close, along with the loss of 131 jobs. It's been described as a genuine threat to public safety. If you needed a reminder of just how seriously the fire services take our safety, then this is it. This morning, hour after hour, they've been erecting ladders, rushing into buildings, testing breathing equipment. But despite all of this, unions say that the huge amount of cuts this service is facing will only put more lives at risk. We're safer than we've ever been before when it comes to fires. Fewer of us are dying than ever before. So isn't there a case that we should lose some firefighters? Absolutely not. I mean, that's testament to the, to what the work that the firefighters do, and that, that proves that's how vital the firefighters are. In fact, the uh, incidents are rising up and down the country. The government will always say that uh, prevention is better than cure. However, we must have an uh, emergency response. In. Head out. Tomorrow, firefighters will protest on the streets, but they have an uphill struggle. The fire service said the government has reduced their budget by 26%. Closing Sunderland remains a last resort. As for Newcastle, two stations will become one. Prepare to launch! When we had a £14 million cut, there were some fire authorities in the south of England that got increases in their budget. Not areas of deprivation, not areas of risk, and that wasn't fair. But no guarantee from you now that if Labour gets into power, this will stay open. The decisions about this have been taken before. The decisions on the budget can't be changed. The government said fire services have the scope to make sensible savings to help the economy. So the plans have been set. Fewer fire stations, fewer fire engines and less staff. This training has never been so important. Well, Dan joins us now. And, Dan, it isn't just Tyne and Weir that are facing cuts, is it? No, it wasn't so long ago that I was standing underneath the transporter bridge reporting that Cleveland Fire Authority is making more than a quarter of its workforce redundant and closing a station right in the heart of Middlesbrough. But the government says that deaths from fires are falling and therefore we simply don't need as many firefighters, so this is a legitimate area to save money. But just to give you a sense of what firefighters think, in one of those meetings that I went to, some of them walked out shouting disgrace. And it's, uh, they're also protesting against changes to their retirement age, aren't they? Yes, you remember that all through last year there were those strikes, most notably in the run-up to bonfire night. Uh, that's because the government want firefighters to work up into the age of 60. They say that's fair and it's a very good deal for the public sector, but firefighters say that simply isn't safe. Uh, as it stands, the government are going to implement it in April anyway, and this relationship is only getting more acrimonious. Yeah, Thank you very much, Dan. On to some other news now, and 100 new jobs are coming to the Barclays Call Centre in Sunderland. 1,200 people already work at the centre at Doxford International Business Park. A spokesman says they will be recruiting throughout the year. Nearly a quarter of workers in the North East earn less than the living wage. That's according to figures released by the GMB union. In our region, Hartlepool has the largest proportion of jobs paying less than £7.85 an hour. 
That's the national rate recommended to take into account the true cost of living. Well, the findings are based on estimates produced by the Office for National Statistics. The GMB wants all local authorities to introduce the living wage. The Richmond MP William Hague says he will continue to be a regular visitor to North Yorkshire after he steps down as an MP before May's general election. Mr Hague spoke to us on a visit to Egglescliffe School in Stockton. There he was questioned by students on a range of subjects from his own career to ways of interesting young people in politics. And afterwards Helen Ford also asked Mr Hague what responsibility politicians have to engage young people in the political process. Well, I think there's a big responsibility on, on all of us uh, to involve young people. And that involves, of course, coming to actually meet young people and, and talk to them, which, by the way, I always find the most encouraging thing of all the things I do as a politician. But also, we have to use all the new means of social media communication um, on Facebook, on Twitter, and so on. Uh, young people are used to using those things. And so politicians have to be able to do that as well if we're going to get their views and be able to speak to them. Now, you famously addressed the Conservative Party conference at the age of 16. Half of you won't be here in 30 or 40 years' time. <laughs> Today, far fewer young people are joining political organisations. Does that matter? It's a good question whether it matters. I mean, it doesn't matter in a way, provided they're getting involved and informed about politics in other ways. And of course, many of them are. So uh, provided they're able to um, find out about the political world through other means, then it doesn't necessarily matter. You're now standing on the threshold of a new stage in your career. How can you continue to champion this region? Of course, I will always be a great friend and supporter uh, of the north of England, including in the, the North East as well as Yorkshire. Um, although the issues I'm most likely to work on uh, after leaving the House of Commons are international issues based on my experience as Foreign Secretary, such as the work I've done on preventing sexual violence and conflict. I will carry on with that in, in various ways. You've bought a house in Wales, but how can you maintain your links with North Yorkshire? Well, I'm keeping a home in Yorkshire as well. Um, and so I'll be back here fairly regularly. Uh, I've got a lot of friends, of course, in, in around the whole Richmond area from being the MP for 26 years. I don't want to lose touch with them. Some of my favourite walks are in Swaledale and Wensleydale. Uh, I will still be seen there on a regular basis. Um, but when I'm, doing, when I'm writing my books and things like that, I might be sitting in Yorkshire or I might be sitting in, in Wales. Helen Ford talking to Richmond MP William Hague as he visited Egglescliffe School in Yarm near Stockton. Well, as the general election approaches, ITV News Tintees is working with schools to further involve young people in the political process. We'd like to hear what you and your school are doing. Perhaps you're hosting a debate or a mock election or taking your own political survey. Whatever you're up to, please let us know. We'll do our best to try to cover it ahead of the election. You can log on to the website, you'll find some more details there. Or you can email election at itv.com. Still to come on the programme tonight, we'll have that all-important weekend weather for you. Plus, we'll tell you why the road to the glitz and glamour of the BAFTAs leads directly to our region. Before that, though, to an underground fire that's broken out near old mine workings on the banks of the River Tyne, near Wrighton in Gateshead. A riverside footpath has been closed in case it collapses, and the fire brigade is still investigating whether the fire can be safely left to burn itself out. Derek Proud reports. A popular footpath along the banks of the Tyne, now an area of burning wasteland, with smoke billowing up through the grass and forcing its way out through cracks in the tarmac. This was the site of Clarevale Colliery, which closed in 1966. It would seem that it's not an actual coal seam that's burning here, but the spoil that was used to fill in two ponds from when the mine was actually in operation. And that might make it rather more easy for the fire service to deal with it. The seam is too far down, it's at a depth of over 30 metres. It's unlikely to be that, and it, 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 is, it is the infill, and you can see the size, the size of, of, of the spoil, which is lying around all over. It is the spoil that is indeed on, on fire. The footpath has been closed because of the danger of it collapsing or trees falling across it. But golfers at the adjoining Wrighton Club haven't been put off their swing. 
the likelihood here is this fire will burn itself out and that could take a, a number of days a number of weeks months in some cases years but even if it took that long it would be nothing compared to this underground fire in australia this is the aptly named Burning Mountain, and it's been smouldering away for 5,000 years. There's many, many instances of coal fires throughout the world in all, all sorts of different countries. Um, how long is a piece of string? It depends very much on the situation, on, on, on the locality. I believe that it is a, a problem right, of uh, spoil, which is old coal waste which has been deposited in a manner that's allowed air to get at it. Under certain circumstances, it will spontaneously combust. We'll continue monitoring the area. If we need to apply a different tactic, then we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that in, in due course. And hopefully it won't last for 5,000 years. I would like to think not, yeah. <laughs> Derek Proud, ITV News, Clara Vale. Fascinating. Well, Simon's here with Friday's Sport in just a moment, but first let's take a look at what's coming up when the IT News uh, continues at 6.30. A British jihadi is jailed for 12 years with the judge warning he posed a significant risk in the UK. Prosecutors say Imran Khawaja committed the most appalling examples of violent extremism in Syria. He faked his own death to try to return home. Coalition MPs insist their radical shake-up of the NHS in England will last, despite a damning assessment which describes it as disastrous. And stand by for the return of the Welsh roar, as England travel to Cardiff for the start of the Six Nations. Join James Mates and me at 6.30. ITV Time Tees Sport Report, sponsored by WeWantAnyCar.com. The Cash for Cars website. Big weekend for rugby, but we focus first on Middlesbrough's promotion push. Simon, it's gathering momentum. They've got some awards as well. Yeah, the superb start to 2015 has now been recognised by the Football League. Borough have won both the Manager and the Player of the Month awards for January. Tomlin's the Player of the Month. He scored three goals as Borough won three league games and drew the other one last month. Aitor Karanka said it was his best month so far as Borough boss and the judges agreed with him. The Spaniard is the Championship Manager of the Month. And while progress in the league is what won him the awards, that brilliant FA Cup win over Manchester City was the icing on the cake. It wasn't our most important win because uh, I prefer to win the, the games in the, in the league, but uh, obviously everybody around the world could... Uh, could watch the the game, could see the our performance, and uh, it was the the main game. But the, for me, I prefer to to keep the to the four games. A great month for Borough, great way to start the year. So now they worry about this manager of the month curse. They play Charlton this weekend. Ah, yes, of course. Football cliche dictates: you win manager <laughs> of the month, you lose your next game. I'm sorry. No. Middlesbrough are pushing for promotion, Charlton their opponents are fighting relegation. Borough used to have New Year's hangovers, they don't do them anymore. Superstition? No. And the superstition would not apply for Hartlepool anyway because Ronnie Moore unfortunately doesn't have that to worry about. Just missed out on the, the manager of the month. Yeah, he was nominated for the League 2 award, but as you say, he just missed out. I mean, Hartlepool actually have, have missed out on a few things this week, what with the proposed takeover of the club falling through. But, you know, Ronnie's not downcast. Never mind January's manager of the month award. He wants February's. In fact, as the boss of the Football League's bottom club, he needs it. Well, somewhere along the way, um, I've got to get a manager a month, um, and that's not me looking for a pat on the back. It's me being realistic to say, if you get manager a month, you've had four wins, and if we can get four wins at this present time, then you know we'll certainly enjoy a bottle of champagne with that one. Well, Hartlepool are away to Portsmouth in League Two tomorrow, and York are at home to Dagenham. Meanwhile, Phil Roscoe's been looking ahead to this weekend's Premier League action. It's been a testing start to the year for John Carver, especially with all the ifs and buts surrounding his appointment and his long-term future at Newcastle United. So getting that first win at Hull last weekend would have felt very sweet indeed. Now he's aiming for his first home win against Stoke on Sunday. Well, I did enjoy it. I actually went home, had a cup of tea and a chip buddy. Um, that's how I celebrated. But you build on it now by getting successive wins, and that's what we're aiming for. Uh, we want to now go back to St James's Park 
and get this a fortress. And once again, yeah, we've got to generate that, and it's how we start the game. That'll dictate that. But I'm sure we want to make it as uncomfortable as we can for Mark Hughes. The last time Sunderland went to Swansea, it was Gus Poyet's first game in charge of the club. They were goalless at half-time, but shipped four in the second half, including two own goals and a penalty. Oh, and they were bottom of the table after taking one point from eight games. So it's not a day that Poyet looks back on fondly. Terrible. Uh, I mean, at half-time I was quite pleased because we were training for ten days about how to be organised and solid, and we weren't in Lille, so we looked all right. Now the second half it was long, long and it was never finished and I keep looking at the referees and please finish this because it was it was bad, a very a really bad debut in the in the Premier League as a as a manager. But a lot's changed since then. There's a bit of breathing space between themselves and the bottom three, and like Newcastle, Sunderland are also aiming to make it back to back Premier League wins this weekend. Phil Roscoe, ITV News. In rugby, the Falcons wrap up their Anglo-Welsh Cup campaign away to London Irish tomorrow afternoon. And it's a vital weekend for the Eagles. They face a top-of-the-table British Basketball League clash with Leicester tonight and a BBL Trophy quarter-final in Glasgow on Sunday. Now, time to meet the North East's first family of boxing. You've probably heard of Bradley Saunders, who's tipped to be the region's next world champion. Well, tomorrow night, his younger brother, Jeff Saunders, makes his professional debut. This is a story about Jeff, but to tell Jeff's story, you have to tell Bradley's story. And you have to tell Jeff Senior's story as well. He's their dad. And don't forget Mum Tracy. Meet the Saunders family. Yeah, it's all family orientated. We're all behind each other 110% all the way. Whatever needs to be done is done, and we're always there to see each other through it. Everything we do surrounds about boxing. We've got nothing that uh, outside of boxing, no hobbies or anything. It's just boxing. Mad if we're not arranging an event, we're going to a show, somebody's coach, and I'll be judging. Everything we do is uh, boxing. Boxing, boxing, boxing. In the Saunders family, they start them young. This is Jeff winning his first schoolboy title back in 2005. This is Bradley preparing for the Commonwealth Games in Delhi, where he won a silver medal. Jeff recently served in the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment and won the Combined Forces title, which means between them, they've won every amateur title there is to win. I mean, my little brother, well, that competitive as in the amateurs, you know. He won his first four British titles, and I won my first nine. And he always said he was going to beat us, and he got beaten in the British final once. And I remember laughing at him in the ring because he'd never won what I'd won. But that's just growing up, you know. But now, listen, I would never, I wouldn't dream of seeing him get beat. Bradley's been professional for a while now. He's fighting for a Commonwealth title in April. Jeff's due to fight on the undercard of that bill. But Jeff's pro debut is on the Rising Stars bill at Gateshead Leisure Centre tomorrow. Incidentally, that's where Jeff won his first schoolboy title. His dad, Jeff Senior, will be in his corner, as he has been for hundreds of fights for both his boxing boys. Bradley's at one step ahead, and Bradley's got the do's and don'ts answers for any question that Jeff asks him. You know, I've done that, don't do this, don't, which, which is great. As far as titles are concerned, I'm not one to say we're going to do this and we're going to do that. All I'm saying is hopefully that kid will be right. I would forever kick at myself if I didn't turn over pro and have a good go at it. Because I've always been thinking, could I have got there, where would I have been, how far would I have got? You're going to get a, a, a nice uh, nice surprise. In fact, you get a big shock from Jeff. There's some really good things to come from him. So meet the Saunders. Boxing is the family business, and business is good. Bradley and Jeff, do they fight at the same weight? Yeah. Yeah, that could be tasty. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I did ask that question. Mum Tracy said, "Over my dead body." <laughs> <laughs> right. Simon, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Definitely a family with a big trophy cabinet. Now, a pilot from our region is hoping to write his name into the record books by becoming the first person to fly a microlight to the North Pole. Dave Sykes has lost the use of his legs. He's preparing to embark on a 5,000-mile journey, though. John Hill reports. He flies solo. The only help he does need is pushing the microlight out of the hangar. Dave Sykes may have no use of his legs, but once he's airborne, in his words, he's as free as a bird. Dave, member of York Flying Club, made headlines with this little jaunt four years ago, an 11,000-mile record-breaking microlight marathon to Australia, described as one of the greatest flying achievements of the modern age. Now he'll be donning a special heated flying jacket and gloves to avoid frostbite as he takes off for the North Pole. 
And from my point of view, being in the wheelchair, I can't really feel all, all sensation in my legs. So it'll be the frostbite is going to be the first thing, you know, keeping my legs warm as, as warm as I can. And then the other thing is just the snow and the, and, you know, and the whiteouts and the actual temperatures down as low as minus 60. And that's not including the wind chill. That could be down to a minus 100 in places. Dave lost the use of his legs in a motorbike accident two decades ago and hitches his wheelchair to the microlight. His route to the pole will take him from Yorkshire, first to France, and then across Holland to Germany and up over Scandinavia to avoid flying too far across the sea. If I have engine problems over the ocean, I end up ditching. I uh, will have um, life raft, immersion suits and all uh, satellite beacons for safety. They'll be out of the icebergs and actually cross over an island called Bear Island, which for reasons I'll probably be polar Bear Island. The flight is raising money for Martin House Hospice at Boston Spa, and Dave's still seeking sponsorship to help cover the bills. Up there, all he needs is fair weather and Yorkshire grit. John Hill, ITV News, Ruffeth, New York. Wow, Dave good Sykes. Luck. Yeah, good luck. Now, on Sunday nights, the great and the good of the film world will gather in the capital for the annual BAFTA Awards. The person in charge of the whole event is Amanda Berry from Richmond in North Yorkshire, and David Wood went to meet her. It's British film's big night as stars jet in from across the globe keen to get their hands on a coveted BAFTA. And leading the team who make the whole event happen is Amanda Berry. It's really important for the industry because the EE British Academy Film Awards are an international ceremony. So when the Brits are nominated, they're competing with the very best in the world. And when you look at this year, we've got two British films in the best film category. We've got three British actors in the lead actor category. I mean, it's just a fantastic, massive, huge pat on the back. The universe is expanding. If you reverse time, then the universe is getting smaller. The Theory of Everything is up for 10 awards. Amongst others, it's nominated in the Best Film category, and Eddie Redmayne could bag the Best Actor gong. I think the British film category this year is really fascinating, because you have films from Theory of Everything and Imitation Game. London. Through to Paddington and 71. It's a really interesting category. But what films inspire BAFTA's chief exec? I grew up in North Yorkshire, I was born in County Durham, so films like Cares, you know, about a young boy growing up in Yorkshire who couldn't have had a more different background to my own. Even The Railway Children, I mean, that was set in Yorkshire, so I claim that as my own. Uh, but they were films that had made a real impact. Stand firm and wave like mad! With big names expected in town for the ceremony and the odd royal guest, one of the biggest challenges for organisers is getting everyone in the right place at the right time. We have a fleet of buses and people will get on whichever mode of transport gets them there, you know, more quickly. And with just two days to go, the final preparations are being made before the red carpets rolled out. And no doubt the stars are fine-tuning their acceptance speeches. All for British Film's biggest night of the year. But for the small team behind the awards, it's a full-time job. When on Sunday do you get to relax? Um, probably about 5am Monday morning. And there's no rest for the stars too, as once the BAFTAs are over, the award season goes on. And it's all eyes on the States for the Oscars. David Wood, ITV News. Amanda Berry, the woman at the helm. Now let's get the weather. It's always sunny somewhere. Thompson sponsors ITV Tainty's Weather. Hello, it's going to be a fairly settled weekend, largely dry conditions, not feeling as cold as in recent days, and there will be some bright spells along the way, but also a fair bit of cloud. But the emphasis really is on a settled weekend, and that's because we've got high pressure in control, and it will be staying this way through the weekend and into the beginning part of next week. As I say, it won't be as cold as in recent days. We'll see temperatures really around average for this time of year. Tonight, however, it's still going to be quite chilly, maybe a few pockets of frost here and there and across southern areas. You may see a few spits and spots of rain, but largely dry, uh, but cloudy conditions overnight tonight. And that leads us into a pretty grey start tomorrow with a few glimmers of brightness through the morning time. But it should improve during the afternoon. Many parts will start to see some bright or sunny spells out towards the north coast, still a fresh 
colder picture with that northwesterly breeze, but temperatures still making around 7 or 8 degrees at the very best. Now looking further ahead on Sunday, it's going to be a fairly settled day, again some spells of brightness at times, but on Monday, or well, the beginning part of next week, it starts off on a pretty grey note, but by Tuesday we should see those cloud breaks developing again and more sunny spells pushing through. The winds all the while are coming from the west, staying on the light side, and our temperatures hovering between 5 and 7.